We're going to take a look at Luke chapter 2 in just a minute. We'll get to Luke chapter 2 in a minute, but I want to ask you a quick question. This is a memory question, so are you ready? I hope you ate whatever it is you're supposed to eat for good memory. Uh, here's your memory question. Are you ready? Okay. <laughs> Uh, this is a memory question. I hope you ate whatever you were supposed to eat for good memory. Uh, here's your question. Are you ready? All right, here we go. Do you remember what was happening the day that you were born? Do you remember what was happening the day that you were born? Now, I understand uh, for some of you that might be a little ways back and you were kind of busy that kind of day. So maybe it would be easier to answer the question, do you remember what was happening the day that your, the day that your kids were born. Uh, I wanted to remember what was happening the day our kids were born, so uh, I tried to uh, pick up a newspaper from the day that they were born. Uh, Susan dug out of Adam's box uh, last night, the Miami Herald from September 19, 1995. As you can imagine, the biggest headline is the Miami Dolphins. Uh, the Miami Dolphins beat the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers, but the problem in that game was Dan Marino got hurt, and so there was great fear and trembling uh, among South Florida in that game. Uh, there's an article here about the Unabomber. Um, let's see here what else was uh, on here. Uh, if you look in a little bit deeper here, uh, the OJ trial was going on. Boy, those were, were good days, uh, weren't there? Uh, the, the Marlins uh, lost to the Phillies. Uh, but Gary Sheffield drove in seven runs. So those of you that are big Gary Sheffield fans, it was a good day uh, for Gary Sheffield uh, on that day. We can't necessarily pull up a copy of the Jerusalem Times or the, or the Bethlehem News to know exactly what happened on the day that Jesus was born. But, but we can speak a little bit to an overall picture of what was happening when, when Jesus was born. One of the things that was happening when Jesus was born is that the nation of Israel would be difficult to define as the nation of Israel because they had lost their ability to rule themselves. In fact, a couple hundred years earlier, Alexander the Great had come sweeping through and wiped out any sense of self-rule that Israel had to itself. And so it had become just a, a vassal state of the Greek Empire. Uh, there was a little bit of change that happened in politics that now had left actually the empire of Rome as the occupying force in Israel. And that had two things that really, really stung. Uh, the one thing was taxes. Rome really didn't care about an awful lot of things as long as you paid taxes and as many taxes as you could get. And what they really wanted from you was taxes and more taxes. Coming alongside of that, was the presence of Roman militia and soldiers that would have been present in every part of that community mostly to make sure that they could collect those taxes. In addition to that, uh, Israel at that time, particularly the southern part around Judea, had what you would call a puppet king. His name was Herod, and he claimed to be the king of the Jews, but the problem was he wasn't even Jewish. He was from the next door region called Idumea, and Rome said, we need someone to kind of be in charge to help us to, uh, how shall we say, collect taxes. And so they put Herod on the throne, and Herod tried to claim to be the king of the Jews. He invested some money into rebuilding the temple to try to make himself a little bit more Jewish. But in that day, they had lost their self-rule. They were occupied by the Roman Empire. There was a foreigner who was sitting on the throne claiming to be the king of the Jews. And in addition to that, there was a massive spiritual leadership vacuum. The people who were coming from the Jewish people that were claiming a leadership role uh, almost fell into two or three different camps. Uh, the first camp was a group of people who tried to curry favor with the Roman authorities. And they kind of said, you know, patriotism, schmatriotism, let's just see if we can't get positions of power and influence. And they cozied up to political forces so that they could get a share of that power. They pandered to the politicians in order to get 
preferences for themselves. There was another group of people that were kind of supposed to provide spiritual leadership in that day, and they were the, their official title were nitpickers. Uh, they, they were the legalists and the rule makers. And they just went around and just tried to say, you've got to make sure you're doing that right. Are you doing that right? I don't think you're doing that right. And there's a right way to do that and a wrong way to do that. And I think you're doing it the wrong way. And there was no, there was no passion. There was no heart. There was no care for people's souls in that day. And that actually led to a third group of people who just dropped out. I said, we're, we're going to go live in the wilderness, and we're going to try to figure things out on our own, but this religious organizational structure, it's not worth it. We'd rather live in the wilderness in little communities than to deal with all of this. Other than that, it was the best of times. Uh, other than that, everything was fantastic. And that's the day in which Jesus was born into now, we think about the day that Jesus was born into as the day in which history is split in half. Because we think about after Jesus is born is A.D. in the year of our Lord, counting forward from the time that Jesus is born, and all the days before Jesus is born we call B.C. or before Christ. We know and we believe that Jesus splits history right there in half. Now, we have to take a, just a minor quick time out and let you know that Jesus was born before Christ. It turns out that, that about 900 to 1400 years later when they decided, let's pinpoint when B.C. and A.D. splits, they added it up, and, and they didn't carry the one. And, and so actually Jesus was probably born sometime between 6 B.C. and 4 BC. But the general concept is, just remember that if you ever get a time machine, you want to set it for 6 BC if you want to be there. Other than that, you don't have to worry about it. But the general concept is that Jesus himself splits history right in half. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Our Bibles ought to just open right up to these passages in the month of December. But it says in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, it says, In those days, the days that we were just talking about, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Now, quick side note, the reason why they were registering people is to more effectively collect taxes. That's just part of the theme that's, that's going on there. And all went to be registered, each to his own town, and Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the end. One of the things I want you to notice in this description of Jesus' birth is I want you to notice the, how historically anchored this story is. It is in the time of Caesar Augustus, while Quirinius was governor. They went from Nazareth to Bethlehem, Mary and Joseph. All of these things are anchored in the specific. I want you to know and I want you to see how real this experience is. Sometimes I have a difficult time uh, talking about a passage of Scripture and I'll say, well, you remember in that Bible story, this is what happened. And there's something about that, that phrase, Bible story, that can almost give us this sense of this make-believe fairy tale. And I don't ever want to give that impression. In this passage of Scripture, look at the historically anchored facts that are provided. Now, there are stories in Scripture. In fact, Jesus is a master storyteller. But I want you to look that when Jesus tells a story, there are no historic anchors to the story. He says something like, a certain man went to a certain place to do a certain thing. And he uses that word certain. He says, you know, 
this guy went to this place to do this thing. There's no anchoring in the specifics. But Jesus' story is anchored in the specifics. I also want to mention to you that Jesus' story is not just anchored in the specifics here in Scripture. But I want you to know that even if we did not have the Word of God, I want you to know that from non-Christian sources, there's a lot of information that we learn about Jesus. There's a group of writings that are called the Babylonian Talmud. They're Jewish writings, but in the Babylonian Talmud, it speaks about Jesus. Here are several things that it says about Jesus. Now notice that it doesn't get everything right about Jesus, but it connects to what we know from Scripture. Now, first of all, Jesus is described as having a questionable birth. And there, there is a mystery that surrounds his birth. But we also find in the Babylonian Talmud that Jesus went to Egypt and learned magic that amazed people the rest of his life. It says in the Babylonian Talmud that Jesus called himself God, that he was tried by the Sanhedrin, that he was executed on the eve of Passover, and that he had five disciples. That's historic documentation from outside of Scripture. Jesus is attested to from history. And in fact, there are some ancient historians that tell us things that are happening in the Roman Empire, and they make reference to Jesus on multiple occasions because of how historic a fact it is. Jesus is born into history, into a specific time and place. But I want to come back to this idea of the specific time that Jesus was born. We, we, we took a look at some of the things that were happening in the culture in that time, but I want you to look at the verse on the screen here. It's from Galatians chapter 4. It's verses 4 and 5. It says, but when the fullness of time, if you have an opportunity to, to, to get that passage open in your Bible and just underline that phrase, the fullness of time, uh, it says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Hear that. The fullness of time. We, we talked a couple of weeks ago about Mary, and we talked about the fact that God had looked out over the course of all of the universe, of all of the world, of all the population over all of time, and had picked Mary to be Jesus' mother. Pretty big deal. I want you to know the same thing happens, that God has picked out over every moment in history the one specific moment that he wants Jesus to be born. He says it is the fullness of time. It is the time in which everything has been prepared for. Everything has been ticking toward that moment. Again, we get it right when we divide history between before Jesus and after Jesus because the fullness of time is when God shoots an arrow and says this is the moment, the spot that Jesus is going to be born. I want you to know that God has worked all of those things pointing to Jesus and saying, this is the moment, the exact moment that I want Jesus to be born. Now, again, we can't explain all of the mystery of why God chose that moment, but with our own human eyes, we can kind of look back and we can see some of the things that were beneficial for the moment that God chose. Remember we talked about how Israel had lost had lost its ability to rule itself because of Alexander the Great. You remember that? It was only like 11 minutes ago, so I really hope that you remember that, okay? We, we, we said that they lost their ability to rule themselves because they were conquered by Alexander the Great. There's something that's significant that happens when Alexander the Great has one of the greatest sweeps of military victories in history, and that is that the Greek, lang Greek language becomes a near universal language from that point on. And when the story of Jesus needs to be proclaimed to the uttermost reaches of the world, it is going to be proclaimed using the Greek language. In fact, our New Testament is written exclusively in the Greek 
language. God had been preparing that moment even four centuries earlier so that the entire language, the entire world would be speaking the same language in that moment. We talked about the Romans and their coming in and establishing the, the troops that were there and the taxes and all of those things. Do you know one of the things that the Roman Empire did that was so important is that it brought order and structure and stability. It, it is known as one of the most peaceful seasons of history. Now, it was made peaceful because of those soldiers were stationed all over the world, but it was a very calm season of history. Not only that, but the Roman Empire used those taxes to build roads that went all over their empire for the purpose of trade. And we're going to see that the Apostle Paul, within a generation, is traveling those very same roads so that he can communicate the message of Jesus to every corner of that empire. It was the fullness of time. We also see in that place that even the presence of that puppet king, that Idumean who called himself a Jew, made sure that there was no competition between Jesus as the true king of the Jews and this fake family line that came from Idumea. There was no competition in that place because Jesus was clearly going to be the one true king. Jesus didn't have to unseat some other descendant of David to claim his role as kingship. The throne was empty and waiting for his presence to come and to take that. And that spiritual leadership vacuum, in fact, the days leading up to Jesus' birth are called the 400 silent years. God was using that silence, that spiritual vacuum, so that when Jesus arrived and proclaimed the kingdom of God, it stood out like the brightest light in the darkest place because the people were so hungry and waiting for hope and a message and someone that would speak in to their soul. It was the fullness of time. God had picked out of every moment that had ever existed or ever would exist and said, this is the moment I've prepared everything for this place. Now, those are some things that we would describe as the macro or the big picture. But I also want to just kind of get you to pay attention back there in Luke chapter 2 to some of the micro pictures as well. Imagine all of the things that have been unfolding there around the manger. Shepherds coming, this birth, trying to figure out where all of this fits. Eight days after Jesus is born, Mary and Joseph are obedient to the Old Testament law and they take Jesus to the temple to be dedicated and to offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving for Jesus' life. And at the end of Luke chapter 2, we meet two characters. They're two of my favorite little characters in all of Scripture. One is a man, one is a man named Simeon, who God has promised that he would live until he saw the Messiah. And Jesus is carried in by his parents. And Simeon says, this is it. And he prays a blessing over Jesus. Anna has a very similar story as well in that place where she had been promised to see the Messiah and she comes and she prophesies. Two people, two older people that have been sitting in the temple every single day waiting for God to move and do something and they are there on the day that Jesus' parents bring him. And they affirm, and they speak once again what God has promised and spoken into your hearts. Even strangers that you've never met know to be true. Think about the encouragement that that is to their lives. So what does this mean? So what does this mean to our lives? What does this speak into our lives, and what does this speak into how we're supposed to live today? A handful of things that I want to encourage you with. One, 
when you turn on the television or fire up your computer and the chaos is displayed across the screen, I want you to know that none of that is news to God. I want you to know that God never tunes in to CNN or Fox News or whichever channel you're watching and says, oh my, I didn't see that coming. Well, what am I going to do now? He is in charge of the fullness of time. In fact, if you look back over the chaos of your lifetime, and I'm not saying it was all your fault, but the chaos of your lifetime, God has successfully managed to get us to where we are today. He has carried us to this moment. He hasn't just carried you. He's carried the entire universe to this moment. And he's got a plan for tomorrow as well. He has carried us to this place, and he's going to carry us past this place. I want you to know that he's not only going to carry that, but I want you to know that he is leading, directing, shaping, pushing, and pulling history to accomplish his purposes. Now, this does not mean that everything that unfolds is something that he directed or that he caused. Going back to the character of Herod, the puppet king, the Idumean who claimed to be the king of the Jews, who remember in the Christmas story that he slaughters all of the infants of Jerusalem who are under the age of two. That's not God. That's not God. That's the rebellion of a sinful person. But I want you to know that God is carrying that big picture, that big direction, and he is shaping it and pulling it and doing it and setting it up to accomplish his glory. So he doesn't just know it, but he is moving it and he is shaping it because he is in charge of the fullness of time. I also want you to know that he has a Simeon and an Anna present for your life. When you need a touch, an encouragement, a direction, a correction, joy, someone to share life with, when you have a need that's in your life, he has assigned an Anna, a Simeon, someone to be present in your life to give you exactly what you need. In fact, as I prepared this message this morning, I'm convinced that this church service and this message is a word of encouragement or direction or correction or joy or whatever it is that your life needs. I am convinced that this service is your Simeon and Anna for this hour right now. And there's at least one person who's in the room today and says, I know. I know. Because God has appointed this time and place for you. And, of and across the course of your life, he will appoint words and people and places and thoughts and encounters to speak into your life exactly what you need. Because he is the one who's in charge of the fullness of time. I would also tell you, that you're Anna and you're Simeon. Because you have been appointed to be that encouragement and that refreshment and that correction and that love and that protection and that care for the lives of someone else. In fact, it's quite possible, downright likely, that in the very same day, God is going to appoint a Simeon and an Anna into your life and in that very same day, he's going to cause you to be a Simeon and an Anna into somebody else's life as well. You are part of the fullness of time that God is unfolding in other people's lives as well. Do you know that every time that we have an encounter with somebody, that there is a sense that we make it more likely for them to believe and to grow in their faith? or we make it less likely for them to follow the Messiah and Christ and Savior of our lives. What is it that you bring when you come to the table and when your life intersects the lives of someone else 
Are you encouraging them and making their faith more likely? Or are you making it less likely? And then the last thing I would remind you is the God who's in charge of the fullness of time has a plan for your life. There are things that he is waiting to unfold in your life. There are things that you are waiting to experience in your life. And sometimes you look at him and say, why not now? And the answer for that is it's not the fullness of time. It's not there yet. You don't want to race ahead of God. The one who controls the fullness of time, you don't want to beat him to the spot. You want to wait for the one who owns the fullness of time. But I want you to know, that he has a good and gracious and loving plan for your life. And he holds the calendar. And he holds the watch. And he knows the fullness of time. We've said that Jesus splits history in half. Before Christ, after Christ. He splits it in half. And we we look at our entire calendars based on in the year of our Lord. We have identified January 1st as the day in which we get to turn a brand new calendar. Right after the birth of Christ, Jesus splits history in half. He splits all of the history of the universe right down the middle. But boy, I would have wasted a Sunday if I had not also said he wants to split the history of your life right down the middle as well. You see, our calendars have a date before Christ and a date after Christ. And there is no clearer message for us to speak. There's no greater word that I can give to you. There's no greater message that I can bring you from Simeon and Anna in this moment. And to say to you, do you remember that moment that Jesus split your history in half to before him and after him? Or is it possible that you haven't reached that point yet? And up until this moment, you've been living in the before Christ experience and you have not experienced the day of our Lord where he splits that life in half. Now you may be used to us having this conversation in church. You may have even braced yourself. Boy, I know I'm going to go to First Baptist Church and they're going to have some good music and, 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 and it's going to be you know, decent preaching. But I know at the end of that service they're going to talk to me about have you ever given your life to Jesus? And you kind of brace yourself for it. I want you to hear I want you to listen to that question. We have no apology for talking about that topic. Because the most important thing in your life is to have that point when Jesus becomes present in the fullness of time over your life. And you can point to this as the time before Christ. This is the time after Christ. That moment happens in a simple conversation between you and our Heavenly Father simply says, Jesus, would you be the king over my life? I've placed puppet kings over my life, people who didn't deserve that throne. I've put them over my life. But it's time that I put you over my life. And Lord, would you nourish my soul? Would you forgive me of my sins? And would you take your place on that throne for the rest of my life. We're going to have a word of prayer in just a moment. And I want you to know that in the midst of that prayer, you can have that conversation with Jesus yourself. If we can pray for you, if we can help you put an anchor down to that, give it some historical roots, and help you to know that it was on December 17th, 2017, at First Baptist Church in Eunice, Louisiana, we want to help put those historical roots down but it's not because you talk to us but it's because you have an encounter with Jesus yourself 
that splits life in half. Let me pray for you as you get ready to respond.